good friend. A dear person. Someone we both look up to, aspire to be like. Someone who is so kind. I just want to be like Gail. On this episode of On the Line with Daniel Holzman and Amanda Freitag, we are welcoming, with open arms, Gail Simmons. Gail Simmons. Uh, welcome, Gail. Thank you so much for being Thank here. Thank you. I'm um, so excited to talk to both of you. Our podcast called On the Line and... Dan is going to give you an introduction like you've never had before. That's not true. I, I, did, I, did, a, I did a terrible job. I feel really, I just reread it and now I feel embarrassed. Now the lead up. Yeah, you can add, is. you can improv. Yeah, I'm, no, it's not, yeah. I'm going to cut, I'm not cut, I'm not going to read the whole thing. I won't do it. You don't you have want to, me to read a whole, I hope you're not read like reading you my bio. Oh yeah, yeah, I'm going to read your bio. No, that's horrifying. Yeah, I know, that's the whole it's point. It's way too much. He wrote something special for oh, me. Okay, I did okay. write something special for Oh, I can't wait. Just that. Okay, so most of you know, welcome, Gail Simmons, obviously. Not, not related to Russell Simmons. Well, we like to say we <laughs> mutually. <laughs> I like to pretend because we because um, your sense of humor. There's Russell. There's Gene. You know, we're a close knit group. Oh. Okay, the Simmonses. Is... Yeah. Um, the epitome of class. Oh. Uh huh. Most of you know her from years working as a permanent judge of the beloved number one television food show, Top Chef. Top Top Chef. Top Show. Top Chef. Mm -hmm. uh, now in its twenty first season. Wow, it's wild. Forever. Mm -hmm. I mean. That's a lot of people. How many people? I was per seven when we started making yes. that show. How many? Ep how many people per episode? There's well, it, it's the different. It has differed over the years. We've had as many as like eighteen to twenty contestants starting, but Times generally 20. there's yeah, generally there's fifteen chefs per season. So you know, three hundred and seventy plus. Blah blah blah. Mm -hmm. Got him. Define him. Okay. So um. Uh, and many of you know her from many of her other roles, leading, hosting, judging, cooking, challenging, and otherwise warming our hearts while educating our culinary palates on television. However, she's not acting, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> that is for sure. Gail is the real deal. She cut her teeth amongst the best of them, working in some of New York's toughest and most beloved kitchens, on the line and in the weeds. Gail is a respected food journalist, a wonderful food writer, a fantastic cookbook author, but of all her many accolades and accomplishments, perhaps her most profound superpower is her extraordinary ability to translate the seemingly incomprehensible, the impossibly complicated, and distill it down into the essence and communicate it effortlessly, unlike me, without a hint of condescension, which is something I'm, you know, and I like to be smarter than people, but you are smarter than people <laughs> and you don't make them feel bad about it. I don't know about that, but I'll she, take it. She's a spectacular orator and uh, deeply intelligent, uh, understand, with a deeply intelligent understanding of the world. Basically, she's a genius and everybody loves her. <laughs> <laughs> and please welcome before she brings my neck for being obsequious, um, uh, someone who I've always envied. And I, I, I thank you for being here. Yes. It's my pleasure. I'm like, I'm really genuinely blushing. blushing. I feel like there's like heat in my cheeks. That was extraordinarily kind. Yes. I hope you can maybe um, just follow me around <laughs> yeah. on the street and introduce violin. me to everyone <laughs> that way. That was incredibly yeah, generous. Absolutely. It's true. <laughs> Completely um, over-exaggerated, but incredibly generous. Do, but like, Not at all. Of all the people in the world, no one has ever said an unkind word about you that I've ever heard. And I've you just like, haven't asked and the right I talk, people. And I talk about you all the time obviously, as well. Obviously. We're constantly talking yes. about you. Um, you know, I, I, uh, that, it's nice. I, I, I like being kind to people. I try to be kind. I also like really, I, this might sound trite, but like I truly love what I do. I believe mm -hmm. I have, as the two of you have as well, been given this like incredible opportunity to love the work that I do and find exciting things about it every day. So I don't have like, I think it's it's positive. I try to start there. Yeah. When you have that kind of gratitude, it just oozes out of you. you know? I, th I hope so. You think so. Some days are not oh, excellent. Well, you're it's only hard human, not but to be negative. In yes. The world. Especially right yeah. now. It's a tough okay. time. But I admire you, and Dan speaks for both of us when he says you're beloved, and we've followed your career for a long time, so I think a lot of people don't know, they only know you from Top Chef. Yes, sure. They don't know that you were, you know, at Food & Wine magazine, you were working with Dana Cowan, mm -hmm. you were doing multiple things. Didn't you talk to yeah. me about that a little bit? Sure, because I don't course. think everybody, any I mean, listener. I don't, it depends on how far you want to go back uh, because I am, you the, know, the I'm early old. aughts. Yeah, at least the early <laughs> aughts. That's actually, we should start, but I won't go too far. Um, but it's true. I, you know, I, I grew up in Canada and I... Um, Quebec, uh, No, I, well, I went to college in Montreal 
and then graduate, but I grew up in Toronto. Went back to Toronto after college and realized I wanted to write about food. My like dream was to be a food writer, really not knowing what that meant because when you're 22 and you graduate college and you have no idea what any job actually mm -hmm. means, right? And I decided that I loved food and cooking and that I wanted to write about it, but obviously I had no idea how to do that. Um, I worked in Canada for a newspaper and a magazine for a year and when it really became apparent that that was like the beat that right. I wanted, um, I realized there just aren't a lot, or at the time, right. 147 years ago, there <laughs> were not a lot of opportunities in Canada. All the major publishers, because that was also like before social media mm -hmm. uh, and before a lot of online properties were what they are now. So it really meant like print magazines. Mm. That's what media meant, right? Newspapers, magazines, print. And so I realized most of that was in New York, but I also realized because someone told me quite bluntly that I knew nothing about food and that if I really wanted to write about food. Did they say it with like a great accent, like, you know nothing? <laughs> no, I wish, I wish. No, they had something more the Canadian accent, so I don't even know if they I can do really that. They said it really nice. They're like, It was yeah, really yeah. nice, exactly. It was very polite. Canadians um, are so But it was lovely. a slap in the face and they were absolutely right. And they were like, look, why don't you go learn about food first because anyone can write. And so I went to New York and I enrolled, came to New York, enrolled in culinary school, went to culinary school. And then thought, okay, now I can go be a food writer. But my culinary school rightfully um, explained to me that I still knew nothing about food. Like, just because you've cooked everything once in a right. very, like, controlled, controlled situation. Um, exactly, like, a perfect setting. You still I mean, don't know what it's like to be a cook. just talked to Jonathan Waxman for, like, I don't yeah. know. And I realized I have no idea. I don't know anything about food. Right. I don't know I mean, anything. But I mean, that's we're what's like so 80, kind of great about it. Together. Yeah, right. Well, when it's you went true. to culinary school, it was Peter Combs, yes. correct? It was Peter uh, So Mark Murphy was a, a guest, and he went to Peter Combs as well, mm -hmm. a school that no longer is called that. Um, I, I think it, it's ICE. It became ICE. ICE. Yep. Um, and Institute, yeah, Institute of Culinary Education. And I, I now. didn't realize till I was doing a little bit of research that you did an intern at Vong. Oh, yeah. No, I cooked at Vong for a while. I was a line cook at Vong. What? Okay, we're just going to go here for one second. When? Because uh, Vong about... was, like, beloved but has Vong been was a deceased. phenomenal restaurant. John George in the lipstick building. Yep. And so Thai named because French. it looks like lipstick. It, yeah. Um, it was, I, like, you know, an Asian ingredients, French technique at a time when no one else was doing that. No one was doing it. Um, this is going to age me. I was a line cook there in 1992. Okay. I mean, it's... I was there in 99. Yeah. And I worked with Dan Del Vecchio mm -hmm. um, side by side, who is still wow. John, John George's yep. right hand yep. man. And it, it was me Pierre Shadlin the chef still there? Uh, when I, I was remember. there, James Chu was the chef. Okay. And then Pierre came in and took over. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I, I was talking about how it trained my palate differently. It introduced me to 10,000 ingredients that in my life I had never seen before, never known about. I mean, it was like such a formative moment yes. cooking there. And I, like I, you know, I started in Garmage, but I did dessert service because there wasn't a dessert person right. at night. Um, and I worked, you know, I moved a bit. Mm -hmm. It was the last professional restaurant I worked in. Really? And then I went back into what I had originally set out to do. I worked at Le Cirque 2000 before Vong, and then I went to Vong. And then from Vong, always knowing, I went to work in both of these kitchens after culinary school, knowing that my goal was really still print and writing. But I really did understand, I had the insight, the foresight at the time, that I still knew nothing and that I needed to sort of get my skills up, speak that language, if I truly wanted to write about it with any authority. Right. I love and that so you did that. so that was that. And then I left Vong to go to Vogue magazine where I worked for Jeffrey Steingarten for two years. Oh, wow. And from from there, I... The man who ate, ate everything. everything. <laughs> yes. Who ate everything. And he did. <laughs> he did. He ate me alive a few yeah. times oh, on competition. Yes. He was, uh, he he was, was on Iron Chef for a while. Yeah. Yeah. That was long after I left him. I left him in 2002, went to work for Danielle, and from Danielle went to Food & Wine. And I was at Food & Wine for 15 years. Wow. But in very different capacities. Like when I started at Food & Wine, I was doing one job, and then I took over the classic in Aspen, and within a year of doing that, started doing Top Chef, and ultimately had to stop doing the other stuff because Top Chef, as part of my job for Food & Wine, grew into this thing that we could have never imagined. Right. So, okay, you worked under Jeffrey Steingarten. Yes. Uh, that can was you describe a him a little to people who may not know who he yes, is? Yes, yes. <laughs> um, Jeffrey was the food critic at Vogue, really the, the the first ever. I mean, it feels also when you think about Vogue, you, know, you don't necessarily think about food criticism, but it was for 30 years or more um, 
a place that had like this this man who wrote long format, very detailed, in-depth journalism on food. I mean, it was he wrote these essays once a month on single subjects. And really, his research and his ability to uh, like self-deprecation and <laughs> at he just had such an incredible skill as a writer <clears throat> and such a true devotion to eating that I, I don't think there's like any writer of our time no. that kind of paralleled the writing he did. And it was it was turned into his writing, his essays in Vogue were turned into several books, award winning books. The first was called The Man Who Ate Everything. <laughs> and that's how I found him from reading that book when I was a line cook. I would like go home at night and, you know, and read, read that up book. late at night when no one else was around to hang out. So you got uh, a little training yes. from he, him. He not only was a brilliant person, but a bit of a kind of mad scientist is, I should say. He is alive. He's yes. just not writing as much anymore. Um, Do you still have a relationship with him? Uh, you know, I haven't seen him in many years, uh, really since before COVID. Did oh. you get to dine with him All, all? the time. Really? Wow. Yeah. I, we worked out of his home. What in an his experience. Uh, how, did you get, how did you get that job working for him? When I was at Vong. Yeah. I, it's actually sort of like Vong plays a key role in the story of getting that job with Jeffrey. I was at Vong. All my girlfriends had normal jobs. So <laughs> as you guys can relate, yes. when you're working the like the when you're working the line of a restaurant, you keep the opposite hours of all the, all your friends. And so all, while all the line cooks would go out at night after service and you know get up to trouble, I went home and would read anything I could get my hands on. And I was living at the time with a good friend who worked in finance, so we literally kept opposite hours. We never saw each other. And someone gave me The Man Who Ate Everything. I had never picked up Vogue in my life. <clears throat> I had never heard anything about Jeffrey. I didn't, you know, I wore like a stained Old Navy t-shirt. <laughs> this old thing. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and I read that book and I was just riveted because, first of all, the way he writes is so extraordinarily different than any food writing I'd ever yes. read before. Um, but in the book, he mentions many times his assistant and whether she it's always a woman and whether she is testing recipes in his kitchen or going out to the green market to, you know, find new ingredients or going to the New York Public Library to research some obscure cultural, you know, food phenomenon. It felt like the job that I right. wanted that the I could never job. articulate because I knew I wasn't going to like graduate culinary school and then as a line cook just become the next editor in chief of Gourmet Magazine, which at the time was what I wanted to do. Yeah. Uh, I knew that there were some steps involved, but I had never known like how to move from one to the other. And I read about his assistant and I was like, well, well, that's it. That's the job. This person gets to do everything. I took the book back to culinary school, back to Peter Kumps, which is now ICE, and to their like career services guy who I had had a good friendship with. He was a really nice, smart man. And I held up the book as if I was the first person <laughs> to ever read this New York Times bestselling <laughs> book. Um, and I was like, do you know this guy? This is the type of job I want. I want to be an assistant to someone like Jeffrey. And I kid you not, he said to me, I saw Jeffrey last week. He's looking for an assistant. Stop. Wow. It was just timing. Kismet. Yes. Unbelievable. Wow. And he, um, he called him, sent him my resume. I was still working at Vong. I was working on the line. Sent him my resume. That was like a Monday. I had an interview Wednesday. And he emailed me, it must have been that he emailed me before, th that day before the interview to say, I see you're working at Vong right now. It would behoove you on your way in to our interview this evening because I could, I was working the lunch shift that day. So I could only see him at like 5 p.m. Right. or whenever I would, I got off work. It would behoove you to bring me a few of their duck spring rolls if you're able. <laughs> <laughs> So of course I, that was that was on my station, that was one of my jobs. So it was easy to do. So before I finished service, I tucked a few duck spring rolls into my backpack. <laughs> she put a couple of spring rolls in her pocket, as you do, you know, as one does. And that's pretty much how I got the job. Yeah. What an extraordinary <laughs> request! I mean, he is just. You were know, you I mean, intimidated by, design, by him? Incredibly. I went into that interview. It was three hours long. He made Ooh. me taste wine blind, translate. You know, I put on my resume that I speak Spanish and French. 
which I do, but by no means am I fluent. But you know, you put things on your of resume course. to bulk your resume up, <laughs> not ever thinking they're going to call you on it. He opened the Il Bully cookbook <gasps> asked you to and asked you to read and was like, you speak Spanish, translate this recipe for me. I mean, it was the most intimidating interview. Oh my he made, he was, he was recipe testing some sort of Brazilian meat at the time. He made me test it and taste it and give him notes. It was the exact kind of interview that like in a lifetime I never thought I would get and knew that I bombed. I was like, you know what? I walked out invigorated. I was like, well, I failed that interview so miserably. But it doesn't matter because that was my New York moment. I got right. to spend three hours talking to Jeffrey Steingarten. At one point he asked me, what was my favorite restaurant in New York? Where had I been eating? Now, remember, I had just moved to New York six months before. And you're working in the kitchen every day. I have day. no money. I was living in my friend's closet. <laughs> Making who what puts Gail Simmons in a closet? Uh, a lot of people. Uh, <laughs> and um, uh, yeah, I was making like seven dollars an hour. Where was I eating? Like I was eating family meal, family meal, and then, but I had just recently gone to a sushi place in the village. I could still be there. I don't oh know. Oh my god, I've heard you tell this story Tomo. so great. That was my favorite. I, when you told this story, I was so upset because yeah. I love that restaurant. Yeah, Wait, we all loved happened? Tomo. It was this like yeah. sushi restaurant that everyone thought was like amazing. Lines out the door around the corner, you can't get in. And I'd so, gotten Sullivan's? in. And he looked at me and he was like, Well, you obviously don't read Vogue magazine, do you? Which is like, yes, I do not. That is right. true. But also you don't want your the whole Could you tell that from like, my outfit I mean, or what? Like, like, did, my you, food now. It's like, can you? It was. I was so busted, and I, I, he was like, "Because if you have, if you read Vogue, you would know that my article in the September issue was all about how much I hate Tomo." <gasps> <gasps> and I was like, "All right, so I'm out. I failed." Oh, but he man. called me two days later and gave me the job. Wow. Tomo, I, I, I'm, I think I'm it was part of the hazing. perseverance. Yes, you persevered through that interview, and he saw. I think he was. You realize in hindsight that he wasn't looking for me to get the answers right. He was looking for my ability to get to answer, to right. be challenged, to, be to take criticism, <laughs> to be brave. He didn't want like a wallflower. He wanted someone who like had a thirst for knowledge and was like willing to be molded in his image. Do you know what I mean? Yes. Wow. Well, so I that was real, that. I got real excited. I was like, I already heard this story. Uh, can you uh, tell me that story one more time? I'm sorry I'm so that excited. I've, I've only got so many stories. <laughs> I, I love Tomo. I heard you. I was yeah. like, listen, I was like, I love that restaurant. Yeah. Why did he hate it? I'm st I, I want to ask you know, him. Because like, it wasn't like pure enough. It wasn't it Japanese. Wasn't, yeah. They had big fish because it was it was affordable and, and it had all a vibe those, and it was right. great. And, of course yeah. he hated it. Yeah. 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 That was it. Okay. So anyway, to, worked for him to go, for two years. To go from Jeffrey to Dana is a very different. I mean, first of all, do they have anything that's similar, the two of them? Um, I mean, yes. I think they have. They both have like deep knowledge, right, of the industry. Journalistic integrity, journalistic of integrity, bar none. Um, and it pretty much ends there. Yeah. <laughs> but you know what about Dana, who was the editor in chief of, of Food and Wine for twenty one years, um, is that she appreciated. And understood Jeffrey. Oh, yeah. And so also had a lot of empathy for me, which is also why Danielle Ballou hired me, because I worked for Danielle for three years in between the two. And I think he hired me out of pity. Because, because he was like, Jeffrey. we just got to get you out of there. Girl. Because he was Jeffrey just a tough, was he a he was tough? tough. Was but he was amazing. I mean, I learned, I, I literally credit Jeffrey. He like gave me an education. You know what I mean? I will never forget. Uh, so I competed on Next Iron Chef, and he was a judge. And was that the Japan trip? Yes. That oh, was the yeah. Japan I've heard so many stories. Trip, but prior to that, um, it was a, a challenge to go cook in a market in LA and then bring it back. Uh, shop in a market in LA, bring it back, cook it, blah blah blah. And of course, you're under time constraint. And we cooked, and I got this shrimp, and it was mealy. It was terrible. But I was in a rush. I couldn't check out every shrimp at the market. Cameras running behind us, and he said, "You know, this dish is not good." And this is a symptom of bad shopping, not Oof. bad cooking. And I, I don't know why at that time it just it was pierced like a your soul, dagger in my heart. <laughs> but he knew. He, of course, he knew. And I, it was like he could see through me. Mm. And he wasn't there at the market when we were running around picking up our stuff. And I was like, it hurt me as a chef oh. because we we believe so much in good sourcing. Yes, and obviously, obviously, all of the competition stuff is unnatural and unrealistic and. I felt like I disappointed my dad. Oh, God. You know I that feel feeling? That <laughs> yes, for so many reasons. Yes. Yeah, I felt that with him often. 
But in the end, well, well, I, I, he, he has a sharp tongue. I mean, like, he, he never minced words with never. me either working for him. But Do you take that as a sign of respect? or is it? I do in the end. Yeah. And I sort of, in a way, I don't want to excuse it in some ways because I think he was also a part of a culture that at the time – it was like kitchen and culture and, yeah. or like Vogue mm-hmm. magazine. I mean, that movie got made. It wasn't right. like a. Yeah. I was there when I was working for Jeffrey. The woman who wrote The Devil Wears Prada was Anna's assistant. That's who I spoke to on the phone every yeah. day. That was my era. <laughs> wow. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, like yeah. the kitchen culture that was also mirroring it, it was a time when that was kind of okay. He was never, ever like inappropriate with me. It mm-hmm. wasn't that way, right. but he was certainly He's like, I- difficult. Yeah. And uh, but I think in the end he was really proud of me and he pushed me because he knew he can, yeah. and he knew that I, I, I would push back right. So then you have this small bridge of Danielle Ballou yeah, going over to Dana. Like so, how so you get to Danielle and you're doing events? Yeah, I was doing events and in my PR. I was working under a woman named Georgette Farkas, who was his oh, like oh, marketing lady. director. Yeah. Yes, the chicken lady. Georgette. Who now is back with Danielle opening Cafe Ballou. Really? Really? Which is amazing. She it's makes like, a great chicken. She I love sure her. does. Um, and so she was my boss. She's the she was the marketing director, and it was also like at a time when Danielle had three restaurants all in New York, and so he w- it was like a much smaller restaurant company. Now yes. it's you know global. He just opened in Singapore yesterday and Beijing the day before. Mm-hmm. Like it's a whole other universe now. But he was like my fairy godfather. Mm-hmm. You know, he just swooped me up as he does to so many people an incredible in man. New York. And yeah. uh, I wasn't in his kitchen. Gratefully, I don't think I could have survived. But uh, I got to be part of this very small team that I wrote three books with him. I opened three restaurants. Wow. I was there at like a pivotal moment when I think the restaurant was really growing and like my, you know, my, the people who were working around me, which is I think what Danielle does best of all, he surrounds himself with the most amazing people. I was with, you know, Andrew Carmelini and Alex Lee and just everyone who went through his kitchen, Lior Lev Surkars and um, David Chang and Rich wow. Terezi what a team. and all these wow. guys who went on to become like Alumni. the backbone of yeah New York City restaurants and watching kind of their trajectories were like this great family of people. Wow. Uh, I mean, the, the idea that like one place in one time, so many people come through. It's bananas. It's, it's mind boggling. And that's just been a through line yes. through the, every time, you know, you Any talk to somebody, it's like, to. yeah. It was a wonderful time. And when you talk about Danielle just having a couple of restaurants in New York at that time, it was the same with John George with yes. Vong when I was there in 92. Mm-hmm. He had Vong and JoJo. That oh my was God. it. It's crazy. And so he would bounce between the two. So if I went, I would go in a little bit early and just try to catch up on my mm-hmm. shit because I was always in the weeds. Yeah. And he would be there. And so I had these moments where I would roll tuna rolls with him or spring rolls with him. He in was the, the best dressed. And he still is. Best dressed. No, Most he, handsome. Yeah. He's a global entity just like Danielle. No question. Now. So it was a weird little nugget of time yeah. where somebody like you got to be a part of that. Somebody like me got to mm-hmm. be a part of that. Uh, it's an amazing like family tree. Yeah, when I was in the kitchen at Bong, I was the only woman. I don't. know. I was too. Yeah, and it was a smaller kitchen. Like I'd come yes. from Le Cirque, which was a much bigger kitchen where I also was the only woman. Yes. And going to Vong, I was still the only woman, yeah. but on a much smaller team. So even though it was a challenge, it felt a little more um, like connected. Yes. I, I I I really liked the kitchen at Vong. I, I did struggled too. a lot at the kitchen at Le Cirque. Yeah. Oh really? Yeah. Why? Just because it was a it was bigger huge place, huge and to... vast, and 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 the culture and was. Your first kitchen my, job, I was an apprentice, so, right? Yeah. Like I and, but they put me. You know, it was an open kitchen, mm. um, and it was just like incredibly formal, four star kitchen. It was the one that it, the Bloomberg building. It, it now. was before the before Bloomberg building one. at the okay. Palace Hotel. Oh wow! And um, mm. and it was just like a. It was it just not a. A different, a nurturing place to work. Yeah. You know? Every time you talk about, it, I just think about like the the circuit in, in Vegas with the. I think they had like a wine cellar with a person on a bungee. On, cord. on a on a, br- a pellet. <laughs> on like a they were, yes, cord. they, they were did. like bungee down through a glass Obviously. dome to get your wine. I'm just like, those were the days, man. <laughs> who 
Closer to things are those. I mean, like, imagine being like uh, investors. <laughs> Here's my plan. The Samoyes will rappel <laughs> down the wall. It was actually pink. That was yeah. where she started her career. Pretty no, I'm just kidding. Yeah. yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> so I was like, oh, you were on the, you had the bungee job. I yeah. remember yes. you. Yeah, I know. I wish. <laughs> with the, um, oh my god, it was a no. great time in New York. Okay, so now you're with Dana. So then I moved to to Food and Wine, and actually, when I started at Food and Wine, I wasn't hired by Dana. I was hired by the publisher. And the VP of marketing, Christina Gerdovich. Oh, um, we all know and love her. Yeah, who is still a major force in my life. Juggernaut. She absolutely powerhouse. powerhouse. Yep. Um, and she became the publisher, but at the time she was the head of marketing, and I had I, I was at Danielle. And I'd become friendly with all the people at Food & Wine because I was doing the PR for Danielle. And Danielle was a former Best New Chef, so they had this relationship with Food & Wine. And they were all in one day for a lunch, an event we were doing. And one of the guys from Food & Wine, I didn't know what his job was, but I'd seen him on television. Oh. Which was sort of like this weird foreshadowing. He was the guy at Food & Wine who, I didn't know what he did in his day job, but I knew that he was sometimes on TV, like on the Today Show or New York One or Fox and Friends, or whatever it was, doing the little, like, Food and Wine's March issue cooking demonstration, right. or the trends for wine in the fall, or whatever it was. So I always thought that was sort of cool that he did TV spots, but I had no idea what he actually did there. And he came up to me and he said, I'm leaving. I am going to open my own restaurant. Would you be interested in interviewing for my job? Ooh. And meanwhile, he also said, this is sort of a side story, but it's a good one, and by the way, who is the magnificent woman behind the reservation desk. And I said, yes, <laughs> and let me introduce you. They got married, wow. had two children, and I got his job. What? It was like a win-win. <laughs> wow. They now live in San Sebastian. She was from San Sebastian. She became the first female general manager of a four-star restaurant. Oh. She was Danielle's general manager. And then they moved to San Sebastian. She was also a powerhouse. Her name's um, Maite. And they now run Jackpot. a brewery and restaurant in San Sebastian, and I took his job. And then I went on television. <laughs> um, uh, wait a second. Uh, I'm sorry. So, so I, you, yeah. you, 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 uh, I, you were at Danielle and all these amazing chefs now, mm -hmm. in, you mm -hmm. know, if you had fourth, foresight or whatever. What, was there any, did any even make any impression at the time? Was there anybody? That oh, you, yeah. Oh, could yeah. You, you could tell who was, was, was actually good or great, or, or was there something about... Absolutely. Um, I mean, Alex Lee, who was Danielle's, you know, CDC for a decade. Mm -hmm. uh, chef, de, chef de cuisine. Yes. He, everyone recognized even then that he was like a star. Spectacular. A, a magical person. He didn't want the spotlight. That was all for Danielle. He just wanted to cook and he wanted to teach his cooks mm. and foster that like love of cooking in them. And he did the same for me, even though I wasn't a cook in his kitchen. Mm -hmm. Like, I would hover around a lot and stick my fingers and shit. <laughs> and he was, like, just the, he was an amazing person in, and still is, still a very dear friend and, and mentor. Uh, and so that was apparent. Um, Andrew Carmelini, I joked that he was at Cafe Baloo, which was 10 blocks up the street. And I would go back and forth between the restaurants. But I would always hang out at Cafe Blue the most because they had the best family meal and the hottest chefs <laughs> on the line. Uh, I can say that now, happily married, and yes. like I was a very good girl, but I'm just saying that that was, you know, the motivation when I was 25. It's a nice crew. Um, yeah, and Andrew was amazing and always really great to me, and he was also, like, you could tell the, him and Alex, they were, like, seriously exceptional at what they did, and they survived Danielle you know, in a thousand ways and remained so true to him. And it, like watching them cook was amazing. And two very different chefs. Very, very different. Andrew Carmelini is the guy that I, whenever I think like, if I had real discipline and could and could actually like see my dreams through, who would I, who would I imagine myself being when it's Andrew Carmelini? Every time you go yeah. to his restaurant, he's there cooking and the food is spectacular. And every one of them is just so disciplined. It's true. Yeah. And his partner, Luke, was his sous chef at, Cafe Baloo at the time and is my age. And so they we were all there with and Rich Terezi was the next on the line. And so seeing all of them, like they they were a great team of guys. And I mean, you've made a books. lifetime of good of, of easy reservations. Yes, for that's it. That was <laughs> the only no I had the foresight there. <laughs> you knew. Um, but Andrew, you knew. you're absolutely right about Andrew. Like he has never wavered. 
Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. In his devotion to what he does, in his like commitment to excellence in cooking, in loyalty as a person. Um, Does that translate through like you? Because you, now you judge. I mean, so many people have come through. We talked about like 400 people have come through your tea television show. Like, can you can you pick them? Are you like, do you have uh, that? Yes and no. Do you ever go to the horse races? I know, <laughs> like, right, I take wish. Her you know, I wish I could take credit for <laughs> any of those people back then um, at Danielle. I'll definitely take some credit for the Top Chef team. <laughs> but, um, you know, I do think that it, without knowing, you know, you do things in your life, we all do things in our lives that you don't realize the value of until you're at the next stage and can look back and see how it served you. And I do for sure think that my time with Jeffrey, my time with Danielle, and then my time with Dana and Chris at Food & Wine, uh, which was the biggest chunk of my, like, working life, mm. um, set me up for a lot of things, right? It taught me a million lessons and introduced me to a million people who like set a very high standard for my own like work ethic and understanding of food. But I also think for the way I kind of viewed the world. And I think that came into play when I started television, which was nothing I set out to do. I didn't, there was no like judging mm -hmm. food when I first went to do it. Well, it was a real community. Don't you feel like New York Absolutely. was a different kind of community within the Well, it was like, chefs? it was smaller because yes. the world felt smaller yes. too. Like Tom Calicchio, who also like in my line of mentors Unbelievable. is at the top handsome, of it all. Head. I mean, mo you know, <laughs> we, we call him America's sweetheart. He's a handsome bald man. I mean, I'm He's very handsome. Um, people's, but... people's one of, on the handsome, what is it? Hottest man alive lift <laughs> at list? I don't know. Was he on that he list? He was once and wow. we love to remind wow. him. Wow. As you wow. imagine, it's our favorite thing to remind <laughs> him about. Uh, literally that on set, we call him world. America's sweetheart. Um, and <laughs> Because he is, and he isn't. Uh, but he will say, and it's so true that like, and this makes you feel like 100 years old, but yes. also it's a shift, it's a seismic shift in the way we think about food now is that he was like, when I was a cook, if you wanted to see what other chefs were doing, you had to get on an airplane, right? Yeah. Or read a magazine cover to cover or and go study to their the recipes restaurant. or go to their restaurants, right? If I wanted to know what the chefs in France or in the chefs in Thailand and the chefs in uh, Tokyo were doing, like you had to literally go there or read the book you yes know? and and that obviously the world for, for better and for worse but has become so accessible and I think that has had a lot of impact whether for better or worse right, right. but I do I do think that um there is something about television obviously that is like two-dimensional that you can't taste the food you can't as a consumer dine there so you judge as a cons as a mm. viewer it's a superficial mm -hmm. ex it, it, it's exercise, super yeah. right? And and I think, or when it's on your phone, right? So I think that kind of plays into that moment of like, and then when you move on to the next thing in two seconds. Um, and that has become, you know, we have a very short attention span as consumers and restaurants, like the, the math of restaurants is so complicated. Right. I mean, um, I, and I think, like you said, it's good and bad. Mm -hmm. And it drives people to these chef's restaurants where they never may have gone. Oh, you've you know, definitely the, done yeah, a net yeah. positive for the industry yes, yes. and for food culture, yes. hands down, right? Right, so it may keep that restaurant open that was open for three months and closed, oh, you know? Mm -hmm. it, it may for sure. do that for these people, or it may not, you know, if there's a big failure. Well, I think you have to prove it. Like, I think right. it's one thing to, to get the restaurant open, it's another thing to keep the restaurant open. You know, we talk on, like, behind the scenes, on Top Chef all the time because we do feel a responsibility yes. to what we've created. And mm. we're not solely responsible by any means. I can blame Amanda yes. just as much. <laughs> yeah, actually, um, it's 100% her. But right. we, yeah, exactly. I like I'll to just blame it. Amanda. I'll take um, it. <laughs> no, but in a way, we also built 90% yes. of the of the talent on the Food Network. Yes. But that's also because we never we didn't have something for them to go to. So that's, that's on us, right? right? And we're incredibly proud of them. But I was just scrolling on my phone last night and noticed that the next like tournament of champions mm -hmm. is 100% top chef ex contestants. Wow. Yes. 100%. It's very interesting to see because there was a long We are a great casting uh, company. <laughs> yes, you are a great casting You're company. You're welcome. There was a long Yeah, well, there's a long long time before um when Food Network talent could not mix yeah. with Bravo talent. Yeah. 
you know, and the floodgates. They still don't let me and open. Tom mix that much, but I, the I rest is open because yeah. our contracts for the contestants are so different, right? Because it's we only have this one show. It's not as if we have something that they can then do with us afterwards, right? That was never something we figured out. Um, so you work, you're working with Dana, and, yeah. And so I'm Chris. working with Chris and Dana. At first, I'm helping run part of the marketing department, and then. Uh, very shortly into the job, the woman who ran the classic in Aspen, which is our like premiere event yes. of the year, the greatest the time, time, thing you yeah. can ever greatest attend. kind of most acclaimed food festival, uh, beautiful of its setting, kind, all the, the best, best chefs. Uh, she left to have twins and didn't return, and I took her job. And within mm-hmm. months of that happening, Bravo called about this idea for a show. Uh, and would we partner on the show, teach them about chefs because they don't know anything about chefs, but they do know about they had just finished Project Runway, mm-hmm. the first season of Project Runway with Dan's brother. My big brother, you like. A little connection and, uh, I know, here. isn't that funny? And they knew that it was going to be a great uh, format. And they wanted to spin it off into the other pillars of what the, at the time Bravo was working on. Mm. And so food was the next thing, but they didn't know anything about food. So they came to Chris and Dana and said, partner with us on this show. Give us the prize. Give us the guidance about the chefs. And in turn, if we like one of your editors, we'll put them on the air to represent the magazine on the show. So they sent me for this weird blind screen test. <laughs> I had no idea what a screen test was. I had no idea what it's getting so into. You had no ambition of being zero. Wow. I had done a few spots because remember the guy. I was yeah, going to yeah, ask you about the guy. guy. I took his job, so then there was no one and to do those spots. He ended up in spots. San Sebastian. Yeah. You're like, this is pretty great. Yeah, <laughs> this is perfect trajectory. Exactly. He did just fine, and um, he. <clears throat> so he had been doing these TV spots and now they had no one and they needed someone to fill that spot and I had I had the cooking skills and I had the understanding of public relations the from Danielle I had the whole thing yeah. I knew in theory they put me through two days of media training and they had me do I had probably done like four television spots you know three minute cooking demos yes. on New York One <laughs> I love New York One before I went to that screen test and uh, they like put me in a closet with a video camera and asked me a bunch of weird questions. And I was like, I, in the closet again. I, I, I sp- it's a theme. It's a theme. I still um, remember not trying figuratively. Out. I tried no, out, I literally uh, for Top Chef. I, and I, I recorded a video. You did not. I, I did. I remember looking at it. Um, I was just dis- I was disallowed to even be on the show b- because my my brother was involved with the producer. Yes. Yeah. Of course. So, so nepotism aside, I would have never gotten. And I. Recently uncovered the video. And it's so we're gonna embarrassing. Need, we're going to need a viewing. Oh, we're going to yeah. need that. I'm like sitting there and I just look, I'm in like this weird chef coat and I was just very fat. Please I send it. I've lost so much weight since then, thankfully. I, I wouldn't have made it. Anyway, it's it amazing. So Isn't that amazing? Great, yeah. Well, also, reality television has evolved so it, much thankfully. since the early days of what we did. Yes. It was like a big social experiment. We had no <laughs> idea. You know, they. I trusted food and wine. Food and Wine trusted Bravo. They said that Tom had just signed on, and we had a relationship with Tom because he was also a former Best New Chef and did a bunch of things with the magazine, obviously. So we knew that they were serious, but otherwise it was like a total crapshoot. At least I I was the employee, right? Like I was the pawn in the game, so I had nothing to lose. I also wasn't known, right? It's not like I had my own reputation. You still would have had your job if Food and Wine. I could go back behind the scenes and carry on and forget the whole thing. But I did have Food and Wine's reputation kind of on my back, which – you know, That's felt pretty heavy, crazy at the time. Um, but, you know, I, it, they remained true to form. Like Bravo was serious about making a show about real cooks and finding great talent. And, you know, the track record worked out. At the time, wow, I remember thinking like these guys have Tom Colicchio, who, you know, his grill station was the it was mm-hmm. the if you the pinnacle you could either work at, you know, Danielle, John George, Le Bernardin. Or, t- or, Gramercy, or Gramercy, Tavern. Gramercy Tavern, you worked at that grill station that was like, and it was the only place you could work with with Live Fire Wood in New York mm-hmm. City and, mm-hmm. and at a respected establishment. It was the place that everybody wanted to work. That's cool to hear. So when that rest, yes. when that, when he got kind of like was on this show as a cook, I thought, wow, this is the first time the Food Network is, or not Food Network, yeah, like Bravo, tele- food television. television is doing something legitimate. And actually, I want to watch yeah. it. I want to see these chefs. And it felt so special. He, yeah. as a side note, said no to the show like five times. <laughs> um, the rumor is that originally, like, he said no, so Scott Conant was going to do it. Wow. Oh, wow. I, I never confirmed that with Scott, but I should, I'll ask that him. was a thing, yeah. yeah. And then 
they went back to Tom. I don't know what happened, but again, finally Tom agreed to sign on with some provisions about from the beginning. I mean, he had foresight. He had his reputation. He had his restaurants. And he insisted on being an executive producer from the beginning. Uh, and he has, Good like, been our North Star in terms of the quality of, like, the cooks and the integrity of the show uh, from day one. And he, I, I think that's, like, made a big difference. But it felt that way to us, too, which is why I think Food and Wine, which was, like, this very, you know, affluent, influential, respected food magazine. Like, no food magazines had been on television before. No. Mm. Right? That we understood that there was a massive audience there but it also it took it took some convincing of Dana Chris and I mostly Chris i mean Chris got me to do it and then had to really talk Dana into it because at the time television and magazines like did not really mix not at all right? there was and no connection no connection them. and would it be dumbing down the quality of our product yeah the magazine brand? was legitimate and yeah. it was in print and it and everything else was kind of like you know, ambitious embarrassment. Right. But the broad reach of the audience of television is like unmatched in especially now in magazines. But then and Dana quickly got it, right? right. And 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 came to understand what Bravo was doing and that they were gonna take Food and Wine's lead on that and Tom's lead. Which is hard to trust. Yeah. I mean television likes to take things and muck them up. Yep. You know, it's hard to trust that when you put so much integrity. And there was no precedent. Well right. there was meet the press and there was Yes. A- <laughs> there was, Meet the press and top chef. And, and the there was and movie. there was like a Survivor and um, Fear Factor yeah. and yeah. and then Iron Chef Japan. Right, Ooh. right. That was like the only competition that was in the food space at the time. time, and that was that had the Japanese integrity. And so a whole other thing, right? A whole other oh, that thing. That was just like great showmanship. Brilliant, Come on. brilliant, brilliant television. And it was spectacular. And it was really not. Like not understood in America initially. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think it was in Japanese. You it was, well, but, it was a... <laughs> but even just that style. <laughs> Literally, of the game. no one understood it. <laughs> of course, it was like yeah. a guy samurai sword, it was like screaming at people, running incredible. around. <laughs> yep. First of all, I understand Tom's uh, answer as no to television because I answered no on multiple. You asks. did? Yes, multiple. The first time I was ever asked to do Iron Chef, I said no. And Jesse Gerstein, who's sitting back there in the control room, said it would be really good for the restaurant. I was the chef at the Harrison at the time. I remember the Harrison very clearly. They called me. I was in the chef's office. I said, no, thank you. Hung up. It was maybe an hour later that Jesse called me and said, hey, did you just get a call from the Food Network? And did you just say no to Iron Chef? And I was like, yeah, I don't cook like that. That's not what I do. Yeah. He's like, listen. Was that the thing that, that like helped to break your... You know, like... That was the first thing I ever did on the Food Network. Really? Wow. But I also That's said no to Top Chef. Person. So just really? being a contestant? Yes. Well, because Her- was Harold at the Harrison with you when he No, won? he was there with Joey yeah. uh, prior to my okay. time there. Okay, okay. So he was the first, the first winner came from the Harrison. Yes. So when I was at the Harrison in 2008. Okay, they, so a couple years it was It was later, and the Magical Elves called, and they were looking for, they wanted female contestants. Mm-hmm. And so, still, so Magical still Elves called. I'm like, <laughs> little Just little fairies we, that would come out of the, fairies that our were, production <laughs> company. Yeah. The production company of, of Top Chef. Who yeah. Were, Casting. Project Run, they, were, they did Project, Project Runway Run. for Dan 15. Dan and Jane cut for it? Yes. They've since sold it, so oh. they're not part of it anymore. Got it. They started their own company, and that company now does Project Runway. But uh, but yes, Magical Elves mm. did Project Greenway Light, Project Runway, Top Chef. Mm. They yeah. do like Nailed It and Sugar. They do a ton of other stuff. They do a mm-hmm. ton of stuff. So yeah. they called and asked about it. They explained a little bit about being in sequester and being gone for six weeks. And I just started this yeah. project as a Not- chef. It was a big deal. And I said, I, I just can't do that. Mm-hmm. And I said, but I know somebody who could. And I recommend it to my friend, Chef Arian Duarte, who was... Of course, who did <laughs> in, it. Thank uh, goodness. Love season her. five or six. Yes. Yep. So I said season no five. a lot to television, mm-hmm. you know. And I understand Tom's reason for doing that. I also respect his reason for wanting to be an EP, an executive yeah. producer, to keep the integrity, to not trust the television gods to, to go with it. And But now... 
in this new season, you're going to be an executive yes. producer. Yes, yes. Congratulations. Segue, man. Mm. Congratulations. Um, thank you, thank you. Oh, I've been a consulting producer for a long time, but uh, we decided to make a lot of changes this season. Great. And luckily, there was enough movement with Padma leaving and a bunch of changes that were happening internally that allowed me to kind of take on a, a bigger role in the show. Um, it kind of behind the scenes, but we've all always been like really communicative. You always it's have never a lot been of input. like I've been in the dark about things, um, and Tom has been you know pulling the strings. The mushroom. That's right. <laughs> it's yeah. It's it's Sorry. it's always been very well, collaborative. Good, good I liked it. Reference. Yeah, no, no, I, I like it. it. I get it. Um, but but it, it true. But <laughs> it just was great to feel like. Yeah, like even more so. And and this season we did, you know, for the first time in a long time, make a lot of uh, like fundamental changes to the to the game. Yes. Which in a show that's been running like for 21 seasons is hard to do. You know, you kind of get stuck in a format and being able to make changes internally, getting everyone on board to make big changes and then hoping that your audience goes along with it, those are like big things in television because people like familiarity. Yes. Until they don't and then they turn on you and your show gets canceled. <laughs> so it's, a, you know, it's a very, uh, you have to take educated steps that way. But I'm actually really excited about it because it feels like for the first time we're, we're making changes that really change the way you watch the show. Right. And I, and I know that I'm sure you had a lot of input along with Tom because they were looking to you for guidance, right? Yeah. The, the connection between the magazine and the show. Mm -hmm. And I can say uh, when we started Chopped as New York chefs, there were all yeah. the original judges, we worked really closely with the producers to say, okay, this doesn't work for a chef. Right. This doesn't and work that was here. It. You know, like just or the that casting process right. too. Would you right, realize. right, exactly. It's like, where did you get this person? They, they'll they never make it through. You mm -hmm. know, you're going to, the show's going to collapse or whatever it may be. But I think you had to look to the people who knew about food For sure. and restaurants to meet with the television people and let them know. Yeah, keep it legitimate. Otherwise, yeah. it's, you know, just for entertainment and it doesn't have anything real and people can see through. And when something's not authentic, it is immediately, you know. Yeah, it, it, absolutely. It's easy to, to spot. It's easy, it's, in this day and age, we can all tell what's an advertisement and what's real. Yeah, That's and, true. and I'm sure this happens on Chopped, any food competition that lasts, is that we learned really early, like in the first couple seasons, if not really the first two seasons, that if the audience doesn't trust us as the judges That's and right. doesn't want to listen to us, doesn't believe us, or thinks we're full of shit, they're turning it off because yep. we are the only... Like, we're the liaison, right? We're the piece between the viewer. We're the taste buds, right? We're the piece between the viewer and the chef. And so we are the piece that needs to connect them. And if we do a bad job or if we're assholes, <laughs> it's a podcast. I can say these words, right? Yes, You're you allowed can. to use um, You can uh, say all the word words. ass referring to a donkey or to the <laughs> rectum of a, of a beast or Perfect. a person who – Both. Yeah. Stop. And um, – <laughs> So if, if like th then like it's such an integral position to you that that we are that we're that like pivotal thing yeah. and if the audience doesn't believe us doesn't like us if we're not likable or interesting to listen to yeah. or n know what we're talking about like. They're tuning my, in. They just, they like, turn I'm imagining on you. my wife screaming at the television. Yes. Whenever there's something like something we don't agree with, she's like. You know, she's Romanian, so she'll, like, throw something at the TV. Hmm. It's scary. But that's good. We want yes, that passion. Exactly. We want <laughs> our viewers to be that involved. And they're so invested in the contestants. Like, Top Chef, you know, the viewers are watching to root for the stories. And yes. we don't see any of the stories. We're not privy to any of that while it's happening. We're only there for the food. So there's this kind of tension between us and them. So if we aren't true and 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 um, constructive, then the viewers hate us immediately and won't stick around. Do you get right. like people screaming at you on the street for... I mean, yeah, <laughs> when we make a decision that they don't agree with, yeah. we often have to really explain ourselves and that's also part of that, right? Like yes. that's part of being clear and explicit in your That's why you get really criticism. good at articulating your judgments. Right, because they will turn on you. Yes. Is television like, you know, so you've had your hand in... Like on face to face in a medium in the kit in the restaurant, you you you've written stuff in print and obviously you have a presence online and in television. Do you think that that this is your medium moving forward, or do you see yourself 
you have a lot to say, not just uh, kind of like about food, but you have a lot to say. And right, yeah, like, sometimes. It doesn't mean anyone I mean, wants to hear it. It's but. in your bio from the beginning. <laughs> yeah. You're quite insightful and intelligent. Well, um, I know what she's going to do when she retires. She's going to be a canoe instructor. Oh, right. That's deep. Yeah, wow. You really went. You dug, guys. <laughs> dip, dip. And Did I mention I was back. from Canada? <laughs> yes. Does anybody know this little tidbit about I don't know. Are you a huge... I huge was a canoe instructor, yes. A canoe Instructor. It's niche. Is that the most Canadian thing? There's about nothing. You? Can you just better. say, just to verify you're Canadian, get out the ba- the boat? I don't know how I'm going to say that, but I will say it, and you can tell me, get out the boat. Get out the boot. What? Did I say get out the boot? <laughs> Her, you're been, you know that I just, you. You did not. I just turned. The... I just turned. I don't know what the word is. I just surpassed. The moment where I have now officially lived in the United States longer than I lived in Canada. Oh, there's definitely oh, wow. a word for that. I don't know what I think it's called being uh, old. Um, um, you're still American because it's all America, but yeah. Well, yeah. now I'm I am both. I just became a citizen last year. Oh, Congratulations. Wow. Congratulations! Thank you. Is but there I've, a test for that? Yes. Yes. And I get I, a hard I one. guarantee it's harder than that any, most. Like, I just bet, point. I bet most it's Americans stuff that not. you just learned once but don't remember yes. from that like could be a great game ML- show. elementary school f- f- uh, civics. You want to know an interesting fact? Yeah. I'm going to stay apolitical when I say this, but an interesting fact is that when I applied to be a citizen, I applied in February of 2020. Oh. Trump was president and a month later the pandemic hit and our applications, my husband and I, uh, our applications just kind of like, you know, disappeared for a while. he was as well applying? He was also, we did nothing for each other from a citizenship <laughs> standpoint. He's a lovely man, but useless in getting me a green card. <laughs> So we applied together, but our, you know, everything slowed down during yeah. the pandemic. And by the time our tests and, you know, swearing in ceremony came and our application came through, now Biden was president. And interestingly enough, the test, the citizenship test, when Obama was president, was a certain test. When Trump became president, he changed the test. He took off oh. he took off a lot of questions to do with uh, slavery, emancipation, the Civil War, civil rights. He took off all of those questions. Interesting. Apparently. He helped to rewrite history. Correct. Make better make 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 America a, a, a cleaner, Great. better place. And then when Biden <laughs> came into administ- his administration, he reinstated all those questions. Ah. So if I had done the test oh. Just a few years before, it would have been a different test, interestingly enough. That's so wild. Yeah. I didn't realize that they did that. I thought it was just like, this is you the actual thing. they had time. other oh, things I... to worry about and that, like, the test would be the test about the history of the country, but that's not true. Never but, you know, it's, and we were just talking about this last night because my husband told me that he read something that if you have grandparents from Poland, you're eligible to be a Polish citizenship mm. citizen, which could get you... European, EU, amazing. Uh, oh. Passport. So n- my grandfather was Polish. I mean, he left when he was 13, but he was born in Poland. I wonder if there's even record. Who oh knows, God. right? It was like 1918. We That'd were from Białystok, Poland. I had rabbinical rootstock. There you wow, go. Wow, Białystok. That is the OG. <laughs> yeah, literally. I mean, we are probably related. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we left in like the 1700s. I, I Actually, someone, I was opening the restaurant Lower East Side, and this guy came in. I thought he just wanted free food, but he's like, I'm your distant cousin? No. And he had a passenger manifest from like grandparents that lived in the Lower East Side, Ellis Island. I mean, the whole thing. It was incredible. And I've got this history, and there was this old picture of this Jewish man with his hat and this black outfit. And if you zoomed in, it, was it your looked face. exactly like that. Didn't that Seth was? Rogen make yeah. a movie about <laughs> this? Literally, I was like, oh my God, I'm a, I'm a old man yes. from like the 60s. Yes. It was incredible. Yeah. That's wild. And he was, he, he sewed. He was a, he was a haberdasher or something. Like that. <gasps> haberdasher. He, he, he crafted. Maker? He did something things like with his hands. No, right. that's a Milner. Haberdasher, Milner. haberdasher, haberdasher. is tailoring. Yeah, so he was a tailor. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think finding out about your ancestry like that and knowing like that kind of craft was in your mm-hmm. blood, yeah. doesn't that make you feel like you have a piece of it makes history? me feel like I belong here and that um, for gener- food, for, for sure, makes me feel like I'm providing an honest living and I can feel good about what I do every yeah, day. Yeah, you should. On the Lower East Side, where it all yeah. started. And you live in Brooklyn, right? I do. Yes. I do. Not in Williamsburg. I'm 15 years too old to live in Williamsburg. But um, I live in Cobble Hill, which yeah. I love. Which so I just, I mean, I just moved there t- a decade ago when I had children. It's a great neighborhood. A great neighborhood. Real New York neighborhood. Real it's New York neighborhood. It's the best. And also has like a really fascinating New York history. Like yes. I love, we live in an old church actually oh, that wow. was converted sadly because 
the you know because the population change. <laughs> no, uh, <laughs> yes, but no, it was converted before we got there because it really is an old Italian American neighborhood that has a Catholic church on every block. Wow. Like the number of Catholic churches in my neighborhood is unsustainable. The amount of guilt in Cabo Hill It's must be unbelievable. <laughs> it's intense. And because the population changed and it was no more exclusively a, yeah. an American, Italian-American Catholic neighborhood, no one was going to all these churches, so they converted them to condos, and that's where we moved. I love New York history because when you look back at those maps where it's mm -hmm. like some farmland and churches and nothing in between. Like, I know, wild. It, it's unreal to see us all living on top of each other now. The best piece of of historical fact in my neighborhood is that there's a giant Trader Joe's at the corner of Court Street and Atlantic exactly Avenue. You can picture the, the, the Trader Joe's. Yes. And there is a, it's an old bank building. Mm -hmm. And there is a plaque on the side of the bank building, which I never noticed until my daughter learned American history, revolutionary history, which I never learned because I'm not American. I didn't learn American history. And to never notice until when my daughter learned this fact that it is, the reason it's called Cobble Hill is it is actually on a hill, and that bank building where Trader Joe's is now was the hill that George Washington stood on to watch, like, the Battle of Yorktown in, during the Revolution. Wow. And there was, like, a plaque. Delicious crab cakes as well. And, like, section. amazing chocolate peanut butter cups. <laughs> and soup dumplings. <laughs> I mean, but George Washington stood on That's that incredible. hill. incredible. Waiting for snacks. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> waiting for those waiting who are in listening, line. That's the guy on the dollar bill as well. <laughs> Correct. Um, yeah. Well, I can't thank you enough for being here. You're just to me an inspiration and always just a light, <gasps> thank a bright you. light in this amazing industry that we get to play with. It is food and love, and we get to educate people through entertainment. Thank you. You guys are the best. It's been such a pleasure. Being here was just yet another example of your. Generosity. Yeah. Your kindness. This was low hanging. <laughs> your fruit. magnanimous. Uh, <laughs> yes. Stuff. Thank you. I'll take it. I'll take it. Thank <laughs> you guys. You're the best. Yeah. On the Line was recorded in New York City at Dubway Studios. Thanks, Al. Our studio engineer and editor is Mark Frangelo. Our theme song is an original composition generously donated and played by Chef John DeLucci. Our producer is Cindy Augustine, and our co producer and publicist is Jesse Gerstein. That's all, folks. Thanks for listening.